Um, I have the pleasure to introduce Philip to you. He is an uh, assistant professor at the University of Texas. He received his PhD in 2014 from the Stanford University and then spent two years as a postdoc at UC Berkeley. His research interests are image, video, and scene understanding, uh, which makes him a perfect speaker today. I personally came first in touch with this work several years ago in pre-deep learning error um, when he was working on segmentation by using conditional random fields. Um, since then, he has built up an impressive publication record on video understanding, detection, and, and tracking for both 2D and 3D data. And today he will talk about learning to uh, detect, track, and act in 3D environments. So we are very excited for your talk and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. All right. So yeah, so today I'm gonna to talk about uh, maybe a little less about detection and tracking uh, than I should and a little bit more about acting too. And so what we're gonna uh, look at is sort of the problem of trying to navigate a vehicle for now in simulation uh, from sensor inputs alone, all right? Uh, you obviously want to do a very good job. You want to avoid obstacles. You want to sense the environment so that you don't collide with it. And this really involves sort of two fairly challenging problems. Uh, number one is trying to see the world, trying to perceive it. And then number two, once you actually see what's around you, you want to try to sort of produce the best possible sequence of actions uh, that you can. And we're going to make a sort of a point that actually both parts of it of this problem are very interesting and both parts are sort of quite hard. Um, now for the first part, what most people default to is you use a very expensive sensor such as LIDAR, uh, you collect lots of measurements, lots of annotations, and then you just build up a very good 3D detector from these LIDAR measurements. And the way uh, this 3D detector most often works nowadays is you just have some sort of 3D backbone and then you're gonna project everything down onto sort of a map around the vehicle. And then you're gonna use your favorite 2D detector to then go detect objects. That would say up to about maybe a year, one and a half ago, this favorite 2D detector was sort of an anchor-based, box-based uh, 2D detector. Um, and I'm gonna make a point that this is probably not the best way to do this. Um, because if you look at sort of what a 2D detector does, it slides these boxes over the map. And this works very well if the car or whatever you want to detect fits nicely inside of one of these boxes. Um, once you found the car, then you're going to go and regress to sort of a 3D location and 3D shape of all, uh, of all the objects, maybe their velocity, maybe their heading, and so on. Now, the main issue with this approach is, well, if the car is slightly rotated or it doesn't, nice and doesn't nicely fit into a box, then your detector all of a sudden will work much worse. And so what we have been pushing in our research here is trying to not use a box, trying not to think about these objects as moving boxes in 3D or in 2D, but instead we'll try to just reason about them as moving points. Um, and so this way, we can still use the same 3D backbone, but now instead of finding boxes and using 2D detections uh, sort of as the backbone or as the sort of the neck of this detector, we're now going to just find a key point, use a key point detector to find centers of objects. And once we found all of these centers, we're then going to regress to the orientation of each of the car, its 3D size, and even its, its velocity, right? Now, this by itself, with at least with current networks, this gives you sort of a decent uh, estimate on where the car is and what its shape and size is. You can refine this by further picking sort of four points on each side of the car's box, if you just look at it uh, from a map view, and then go back and say, hey, I'm just going to extract some more features and do this entire regression to where the car is again. And then we're going to produce sort of a, a final 3D box and a final score. Right? And so that's sort of the detector. If you go think about things not as sort of boxes from the start, 
but instead of think, uh, you think of sort of objects as just points. Now there's one additional benefit of thinking of these objects as points, which is that you can actually easily express sort of the motion of each object or the, the track that an, uh, that an object follows as just a vector through time. So the difference between the current car location and the previous car location, or at least the center location of these, is just going to be a vector that points from the current location to the previous location. And we can just predict that vector as an additional output of our network. Right? And so points, it's very, it's, uh, points are a very nice representation because as boxes, we can reduce everything to just 2D detection. Now we just detect centers instead of detecting uh, boxes. And the nice thing about points is they are rotationally invariant. So if you rotate your view, the center of the car is always going to remain the center of the car. All right? um, and the other thing is tracking is almost free. As soon as you have a velocity estimate, which most of these 3D detection benchmarks force you to predict anyway, you get free tracking or a very simplified version of tracking. And so in general, this works quite well, especially for objects that are sort of don't nicely fit sort of uh, individual boxes. And so if you compare how well a point-based detector works versus uh, off-the-shelf uh, box-based detector on exactly the same backbone, uh, you can see if you look at objects that are sort of nicely aligned to the current ego vehicle, not much changes. If you go a bit uh, to a bit further uh, angles, Again, not much changes, at least for vehicles. Where the point-based detector really shines is sort of objects that are almost 40 at a 45 degree angle to the reference frame of your box. And you can think of sort of these are objects where your eco vehicle is something that looks like this. And then all other vehicles are sort of at a 45 degree angle. And so this is what you would see, for example, if you take a turn. Um, and so in these instances, the, uh, the point-based detector works a lot better than sort of the standard anchor boxes. It also works a lot better for pedestrians, which you can see here. And the main reason for this is that a point feature can actually deal with smaller objects a lot better than sort of uh, an anchor-based feature could, right? Um, this worked quite well on the new scenes benchmark. I think when we originally submitted this, we came in uh, first on new scenes. By now, we're no longer first, but uh, we're still, I think, it's about 80% of all the top entries use sort of point based representations the same way we do now. Um, and I think most of them use our code base. It also worked quite well on the Waymo uh, challenge. And there, sort of, I think we came in second this summer and we found out after the challenge, oops, sorry. We found after the, uh, out after the challenge that the first entries also build on this exactly same code base. It also uses point-based detectors uh, in, in internally, right? So I'm quite happy this works quite well. Um, and so this is sort of the standard result you would get after you run one of these point-based detectors. And you can see sort of for cars that are close by, you get lots of measurements, you get very accurate boxes. And even for objects that are a bit further away, you still get a few points and the detector is able to sort of localize where things are. Now, this is for cars. Uh, one issue is if you look at other objects, objects that are not cars, and you look at a standard LiDAR sensor, this here is an example from the new scenes sensor. Um, you can see that this, this, this measurement is actually very, very sparse, right? It's uh, about 10 to 100 times, you have about 10 to 100 times fewer measurements in this LiDAR scan than you would have in the corresponding color image. And I'll just zoom into one particular region here, which is the pedestrians back here. And you, lean, you really only have like one or two measurements. And it's not like that these pedestrians are actually quite, uh, are very far away. I think they're maybe about 20, 30 meters away. So if they were in your, in your lane, in the lane you're traveling, they would still be a pretty, pretty big danger to the, or you would be a pretty big danger to them, all right? Um, and then the other sort of issue, which I'll punt on in this talk is there's also a whole long tail of classes. And I think Deva really nicely highlighted some of this. And so we'll look at what do we do with these sparse light or with the sparsity of the LIDAR? Well, 
one thing we could do, uh, and I'll show this in numbers first. Okay, so in numbers, this means that if you're close by, you get a very good detector. And so these are mean average precision numbers, and 76 is almost perfect. Uh, I don't think you need to go much beyond 76. It essentially means that you either get 76% of all objects perfectly right, or you get sort of all objects about 76% right, uh, or something in between, right? And if you go further down, if you go to like 30 to 50 meters, this drops to about 37 MAP. And I don't think I would want to travel in a vehicle that has, a, has an accuracy of about 37. Um, now, what this means is sort of, if you look at this scan, sort of the objects in this area, these are the ones we get pretty well. And then if you go sort of further out, you go to objects that are out, sort of outside of this yellow area here. Here we essentially, I mean, it's not quite a coin flip, but it's not, it's not, it's not very far from a coin flip. And especially localization is gonna be an issue, uh, trying to figure out sort of uh, how to track these and so on. Um, now, one way to get around this is to just buy a better sensor, all right? So we can just say, okay, well, new scenes used a fairly low resolution sensor, 32 lanes, so 32 sort of scans horizontally. That might not be the ideal uh, configuration. Maybe you can go to 64. Yeah, it's still sort of, if you build a vehicle, maybe 3000 is not too much to get autonomous driving working. If you wanna to go to a resolution one higher, like 128, you're, soon, you're slowly approaching sort of the cost of the entire vehicle of just putting this little sensor up top. All right. Now, if you compare this to just going on Amazon and buying a color camera, well, you can get 10x the resolution from that color camera for about $25. All right. Uh, and this is not even the cheapest. All right. Now, the issue with the color camera, obviously, is you don't get that. And so, we tried pretty hard to come up with a very fancy way to combine these color images and combine uh, sort of LiDAR scans. And what we started out with is, okay, we have good semantic segmentation or good instant segmentation on these color images. Well, let's just take this, let's take the points, and now let's try to figure out a way sort of to create denser point clouds and a better understanding of these objects by having these two things interact with one another. And we tried a few things and Nothing worked as well as just the dumbest possible thing we tried first. And the dumbest possible thing we tried was, okay, let's just sample a bunch of points. So we'll go into the each, each instance segmentation mask. We'll sample a bunch of points that were not directly at the same location as the LiDAR measurements. Then we'll look up the closest LiDAR measurement within the mask and just say, okay, we're going to steal the depth from that LiDAR measurement. And that actually gives you a really good high resolution sort of virtual uh, the uh, 3D point cloud um, that sort of has these fake depth estimates in there, but it has the original shape of the 2D instant segmentation. Um, and so just to recap, what we do is we run instant segmentation on color images. Then we randomly sample, actually it's not randomly, I think it's regularly sample uh, points within each detected instance. Then we lift these points into 3D by sort of stealing the depth from nearby points. And then in the end, sometimes we have a little bit of filtering. Um, so there's sometimes it can happen that you steal the depth from a wrong, from, from sort of a background point, And we have some simple heuristics to filter these out, but that's pretty much it, All right? Super simple, um, but it works quite well in practice. And so if we start out with a point cloud like this, what would happen is we would add additional points where our instant segmentation thought objects were. And this might not look like a lot of points and it really in sort of in terms of the entire point cloud, it's very few points we add, but we add them at the right location. So here, down here, you would see a scan or would see some measurements on a vehicle. I think there's about 10 measurements of original LIDAR and we were able to blow this up to hundreds of measurements that have a very good 2D shape and the 3D shape roughly follows a sort of the close by LiDAR points. This becomes even uh, more pronounced if you look at the pedestrian here on the side. Originally, you couldn't even see the shape of the pedestrian. Uh, you just saw sort of five points. And then once you actually project a 2D uh, segmentation into 3D, you can see a fairly detailed outline of that pedestrian. Now, 
we can just take this augmented point cloud and feed it into the standard 3D detector. And we do one more thing. Um, since we run instant segmentation first, we also feed in the instance labels. So instant segmentation can tell us, hey, this is, uh, this is a pedestrian, this is a vehicle, and so on. And we'll feed that information in there too. I think there's a question in the chat. Okay, no, okay. Um, okay, yeah. And obviously the advantage, the advantage is that it gives you a much denser estimate uh, or much denser measurements around each object. Um, but the overall density of your point cloud actually doesn't change significantly. I think we only add at most 20 to 30% more points to the point cloud. Uh, we just add it around objects that we think uh, are important. And we get these semantic labels sort of for free, at least for the points that we add. If you look at sort of the performance of, um, of this, if you just run center point, which is our 3D detector, without any sort of augmentation or without any sort of labeling of virtual points, without, any, uh, without adding anything, uh, we're about a, a 60 point MAP. This is without sort of ensembling and test time augmentation. Um, if we do this, we can get slightly higher, but we wanted to compare sort of um, just one to one without any additional tricks. And then if you add these virtual points, you get to about 67.1. So you get about a 7% boost, but it's adding more points from the color images. Um, we can also look at sort of where do we start to win. And if you look at objects that are close to the vehicle, uh, we don't win very much. Uh, then if you travel, for, if you go further and further away from the vehicle, you can see the boost increases uh, more as you get sort of higher resolution points from these color cameras. All right. Um, then I mentioned there is also sort of uh, an issue with long tail uh, objects and classes, but I'll totally punt on this in this talk, and uh, maybe you'll catch me later at some point talking about this. All right. And so this is sort of part of the driving stack, which is sort of the perception part. Now, I would actually argue that we have a pretty good understanding on how to get this perception part to work well. Um, and so sort of as general recipes, we can use ideas from part one. We can use ideas that we had that I see, I've seen in this talk, in this uh, workshop here. And we just add sort of, sort of lots of supervised learning to it. We can add lots of data augmentation to it and lots and lots of data. And sort of the sense right now is if you throw enough money at this problem, uh, eventually it will yield. Or it will yield at a level at which sort of we can have safe vehicles. Um, I mean, obviously, there's going to be a panel discussion, so people can disagree with me there. Um, yeah, but what I would like to highlight here is there's actually a second part to this entire problem that I don't think will yield just by throwing more money at it. Um, and that is sort of the acting in the, in the world and sort of trying to then take the vision input and come out with, uh, come up with good trajectories and safe sort of driving behavior. And the reason why I think the second problem will not yield by just throwing more data and money at it is that the agents, sort of other agents' behaviors and your own behavior is in such a long tail um, that it's quite hard to model We're using our current tools. And a lot of sort of the problem, um, a lot of the mistakes you make are extremely costly. Um, it's, uh, it's not like if you have a misdetection 100 meters down the freeway, you can say, okay, fine, maybe maybe it might not be important or maybe it will show up later. If you turn the wrong way and you crash into something, there's definitely gonna be a, a big consequence to this, all right? Um, and so let me set up sort of the problem that we're looking at here. Uh, let's say we start out with observations um, and these observations can either be a map, it can be semantic segmentation, it can be anything that is produced uh, right now. And the problem that we want to solve is, okay, we look at these observations and eventually we want to come up with actions. Um, and for simplicity now, we just think of this as just being one function that takes observations and produces actions. There's much better ways to parameterize this, uh, but for in the interest of this talk, I think this one sort of mapping is, is, is sufficient. All right. Now we could just apply supervised learning to it. So that the way we sort of made lots of progress in computer vision was, okay, we'll just use, collect a lot of data, a lot of data, 
and apply supervised learning to it. And this is called imitation learning uh, in, in sort of in robotics or related fields. And so you take a data set where you just record all your observations, you record the actions that the person took that drove the vehicle while you were uh, going through and recorded the data. And then you just opt uh, optimize some supervised loss. And this was actually the very first thing, the very first sort of autonomous vehicle in the world used this approach. And they were able to drive about one and a half to two miles per hour um, with a little bit of intervention and a gigantic army ambulance um, with lots of computers inside. But they were able to do this about 30 years ago. All right. Um, now, if you would strap this onto a modern car, this would hopelessly overfit. Um, and there's lots of tricks you can make, uh, you can you can use to make sort of imitation learning a bit more robust. One is to add noise while you collect the data, and so you can think of you're now in a car that sometimes does what you think and or what you want, and sometimes does something completely different. Um, and so that's that's one way to sort of make these policies more robust and overfit less. And another way we sort of devise is we can train two policies, uh, one on ground truth data, and then one on actual sensor data. And that will also help a little bit with overfitting. All right. Um, all right, and so imitation learning is quite nice. It's uh, very simple, it's just supervised learning. And I think if you start out in the field, I would recommend everybody just try imitation learning first. Uh, it's sort of what we are used to from computer vision. All right. Um, now the issue is it only really gives you a good driving policy on or very close to the other to the observations that you have already seen. And as soon as you start to move away from some of these uh, seen observations, imitation learning can 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 go or can sort of yield arbitrarily bad policies because it has not it, it has not seen the behaviors and has not seen the observations of sort of slightly suboptimal driving. Uh, you can also not tell if the action that was executed was just one of the good actions or if the, it was really the only action that he could have done to not crash in this instance. And so what I, the way I think about this is we have supervised learning sort of in, in, in the domain of learning to act, but we don't have very good ways to augment the data. Um, and it's very much the same as sort of if you would take standard 3D or 2D detectors and train them without any data augmentation, um, without any networks that somehow generalize uh, beyond their training data, and you would also see they completely overfit and they wouldn't work. All right, and so just to give you sort of an intuition of what the data is we have, um, so this is sort of uh, driving data that you see, and now you'd want to learn sort of to execute actions in this driving data. And this driving data is pretty safe, pretty boring. There's nothing really bad happening in it. Um, and you would just learn, you would want to learn sort of what to do in all sorts of scenarios from just this sort of boring data. And obviously this is not going to work. Um, what you actually want is you would want to learn from sort of a bit of outlier data. And uh, I don't know if any of you, or if you're ever bored, you can go on Reddit and look at, at idiots in cars and you'll see lots and lots of outlier data there. All right. And so you would actually want to learn what to do in scenarios where you're driving down the street, right? And then here comes another guy and bam, runs into you, right? You would want to know how to react to this, right? And I mean, the driver in this vehicle had exactly the right reaction, right? He stopped and, uh, and sort of did the right thing that the other guy didn't. But uh, yeah, you would still want to learn sort of what to do in sort of these outlier scenarios, if you ever want to go deploy a car in the real world. And so our sort of idea was, well, we can't really collect that data very well, um, but we could maybe try in some limited setting to be the idiot in the car. Um, and sort of the an analogy to being an idiot in the car, uh, sort of in learning to drive is reinforcement learning. And so what reinforcement learning does is it tries to explore sort of what could you do with the vehicle and what sort of effect would it have? And you try all sorts of weird things. And so you start out again, wanting to learn a policy. 
Now you get access to a transition function. This either can be a real vehicle that you can drive or it can be a simulated vehicle that you can drive. And you get a reward and the, the reward just says, okay, this is good driving, this is bad driving, but you're allowed to sort of experience both as long as at the end of the day, you're gonna give me a policy that only does good driving. Um, you do this by collecting trajectories and then sort of optimizing the reward. So optimizing for good driving under a certain policy, but the policy gets to explore both behaviors. Now, obviously this can lead to better than human performance because you can now explore what other possibilities could you have uh, executed in every single state. Slightly data inefficient because now instead of just driving like we mo most of us humans do, you also explore all sorts of other weird driving behaviors and it's potentially dangerous. I mean, if you do this in a simulator, it's perfectly fine. If you do it, you, you probably don't ever wanna do this in the real world. Right now, one very interesting and cool variant of this is offline reinforcement learning. And here you again train a policy, but now you're going to use recorded data to do reinforcement learning. So you're trying to learn to be the idiot in the car on recorded data. So there is no danger to the environment around you. And the way to make this work is to learn sort of a mental model or learn a transition function that says, hey, how do I go from one state to the next state? And how do my actions impact the world around me? Um, you again have a reward that you specify, and now you can just optimize for your policy under that learned transition. So this is a very safe way to run reinforcement learning. Um, it can again learn better than human uh, policies. It has no sort of dangerous explor uh, explorations. And the main issue is it's just almost impossible to learn this transition. It would have been too good to be true uh, if you could have learned this transition and all of the sudden reinforcement learning would be solved, right? So what do we do? Uh, in a paper here at ICCV, we said, okay, well, what if we make sort of a very wrong assumption? What if we assume that the ego vehicle and the world are somewhat independent? So what if you assume that the ego vehicle, we can influence the, uh, the ego vehicle through our actions, but we cannot influence the world. And the world completely ignores the vehicle. The vehicles can still look at the world when it acts, but the world doesn't care that the vehicle is there. Um, and so it turns out if you make this sort of assumption, you can start to model the world the same way we model the world in computer vision, uh, just as sort of pre-recorded logs with annotations and in a completely model-free way. And so you can just replay sort of, uh, sort of your favorite tracking or 3D detection data set and learn to act within that data set. Now, obviously the data set will not react to you. Um, in order to get anything reactive, you need to learn a model of the vehicle. Um, but then once you have that, you can go and explore sort of all possible different consequences of your actions within that sort of static data set. And yes, we cannot influence the world. All right, now the nice thing about this sort of assumption is that it simplifies reinforcement learning massively. And if you start just by the sort of the most basic definition of what reinforcement learning does, which is the Bellman update, what this says is it says, well, if you wanna know how good you're driving right now, you can look one step into the future, execute the best possible action, and then just look at how well you would do in a second into the future, and then you can just like sort of walk this backwards. If we plug in the world and rails assumption, um, you can see that nothing really changes. We just have two parts of the state in there now, but one part of the state we can sort of just remove. We can remove all the state that depends on the world because it doesn't change. We already know how the world is gonna evolve. Uh, so we don't need to care about that. And we can just move this sort of into an index of the value function here. So this is the, index here, now the entire world is just condensed into a time index. And now if you look at this, uh, this equation, you can see that the value function here is actually quite small. Uh, it only depends on the sort of the state of the vehicle, which is, if you look at it from a map, it's an X, Y position, an orientation and, this, and the velocity. And so what we can do is we can discretize this in a table. So we just say for all possible sort of states of the vehicle, we're now gonna compute how good 
uh, how good of a driving behavior we could produce from that state. And we do this recursively by looking at the reward function and sort of the value function at the next time step. And then we look at where the transition model would take us from the current state to the next state. And then we can just repeat, compute this for time step t, t minus one, t minus two. And now we have a map for every single part of our ground truth data set that tells us if the ego vehicle is here at this state, it can drive well. If it's somewhere else, maybe it's going to crash soon and that will show up in the reward. Then we can go and train a policy that way. And so the way we start, we start with pre, pre uh, with pre-recorded trajectories, and you can think of these just our computer vision data sets. We learn a forward model. Uh, in our case, it's a very simple bicycle model. It's just a bunch of mathematical equations with parameters. Then we sort of learn these value functions step by step for about, I think, three and a half seconds into the future. We look at sort of what are the, the, the good states to be in, and that will give us sort of a, sort of a labeling for how good each action at the current time step would be. And then we have, uh, we just sort of do distillation to a real policy that can then execute these actions. And in this distillation step, we sort of go over all possible actions, all possible speeds, high level commands, and some limited orientations. And so that will allow us to sort of supervise a policy that says, hey, from the current observation of the vehicle, what would have been good things to do? And then we evaluate this on a no crash benchmark uh, where we just want to navigate sort of on point A to point B. Input is image. It's actually four images for us and a high level command, which says turn left, turn right, go straight. And then we output steering, acceleration, and braking commands. And on no crash, this works uh, sort of this world on rails assumption, even though it seems very wrong. It works a lot better than, for example, even the best sort of imitation learning algorithms that we had or prior reinforcement learning algorithms. So prior RL is in blue here and prior imitation learning is in yellow. It also worked quite well on the Carla leaderboard. Um, and here the metrics that we look at is driving score, which is a combination of how often we're able to go from point A to point B within a certain time limit and how many times did we violate traffic laws on the way there. And at least at the time of uh, submission, at, uh, or at the time when we submitted this at the leaderboard, we did quite a bit better than all prior work. Um, we sort of outperformed the last year's winner of the challenge by about six points uh, in driving score, which is a combination of these infraction and, and route completion metrics. Yeah, and so the nice thing about this is, so once we start to make this sort of wrong assumption um, that the world and the ego vehicle are somewhat independent, we can start to use all the data sets that we have collected this far and just try to learn reinforcement learning algorithms in them. Um, and so the other nice thing is that it actually simplifies reinforcement learning to a point where you can just have tabular evaluations. You don't need value function approximations or anything. It's just you estimate tables and do some interpolation. That's it. All right. And one way I think about this is that sort of this reinforcement learning or this offline RL gives you back some of the some of the data, data, data documentation that we were missing um, in, in original policy learning. It's obviously not giving you everything, but it gets you quite a bit more. Now, I'm mostly at the end here. I would like to thank all the good students and collaborators I had here. And I would like to point out that one of them, uh, Tianwei here, he is an amazing undergrad. He did all of the work to, on 3D detection, and he's going to be looking for grad school soon. So if you're looking for an amazing new grad student, definitely look into him. All right. Good, and I'm happy to take questions. I'll go from the top. Yes, th thanks so much for your uh, talk. Yeah. I think there were quite some questions in the chat. Yes, okay. Yeah, I think the top one is like, what happens uh, with camera visible objects which have no LIDAR points at all? I think the short answer is nothing really good. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so 
if it really if there's really no lidar measurement at all uh i don't think we will even consider um interpolating because we only look at lidar points that fall within our instance masks if it happens that the point on the ground will fall in the instance mask um then we'll just essentially just use the same depth for the entire instance and so you'll get sort of a, a 2d billboard uh standing in the in the scene um did you try virtual points approach in combination with monocular depth completion method yes um yes we we considered it and then um we didn't think it would give us a good enough improvement um and then we sort of sided on the on the side of simplicity um I think it would definitely work um, if you use sort of either mono depth or you could even use depth interpolation, right? Since you do have you do have sort of nearby depth measurements that you know are quite good. Um, we just couldn't figure out a very simple way to do this. Um, what are the remaining not solved problems of proposed driving in a world on Rails method? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I think there is there's there's a lot. I mean, for starters, safety is probably one thing that we haven't considered very much. Um, we haven't really considered any sort of interactions. And so the one thing where the world on Rails assumption really fails is if if you think of you're merging into traffic. Um, and if you want to merge into traffic and you have some sort of observations on when the when the ego vehicle or the actual driver merge into traffic and you don't merge it at exactly the same time, what will happen? The car behind you will just run into you, right? Because it ignores you. And so that's sort of one of the big failure modes where we would need to look at interactions a bit more. Um, the other thing is we don't always uh i don't think we should actually produce actions directly i don't think we should produce steering acceleration and braking directly these are horribly like they're not interpretable at all um, i think we should produce trajectories or plans and that's also something we haven't looked at in, in that much detail yes uh what reward function do we use yes so we had a reward that sort of we had around other vehicles or pedestrians we had sort of a no drive zone um if you enter the zone around a vehicle where you could collide your reward was just sort of encouraging you to to slow down or brake uh, or avoid the vehicle um and then we had a reward that said you should stay within the lane um and i think that the reward sort of uh, got linearly worse the further you got out of the lane and then we had a third one, which I would have to look up in the paper exactly what it was. Okay, thanks again uh, for your okay. talk. Thank you.